That's great. Hello and welcome. So welcome to this session, building a course around picture books, why, how and wow with Fiona Hunter. And this is the first session in our mini event, Stories in the Classroom. So before I hand over to Fiona, let me introduce you. So Fiona Hunter is a teacher, a trainer and the creator of the Kids Club English website, where she self-publishes crafts and games and offers teaching support. So we'll be sharing uh, the links to Fiona's work later on. She has a passion for teaching through stories, songs, games and crafts and have a so has a soft spot for puppets. Ah, I didn't know that. So you're a, you have a, a, a secret love of puppets. Not so, so secret. <laughs> not so secret now. No, I've just told like 20,000 people. <laughs> okay, so thanks for joining us, Fiona. We're very happy to have you here today. And over to you. I'm here if you need me. Okay, thank you. Oh, it's just wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to see just you're all here from all around the world. And and, and I think that's, that's just brilliant. Um, so I'm just sharing my uh, slides with you now. Um, and I'll try and keep my eye on the chat. So I'm going to be asking you some questions. I hope you can help. So, um, you know, this is building a course around picture books. And before we kind of get into it, it would be really great if um, we could find out a bit more about you. So I've got a question for you. Uh, well, two questions, really. Do you teach a course based around stories now? So just a yes or no. Do you? Yes, good, no, yes. Okay, mixes, well, it's quite a mix here. More no's than yeses maybe, okay. Oh, lots of yeses, brilliant. Not really, it's okay. And if you don't teach a course based around stories, do you use picture books in your courses? So lots of yeses, definitely, yes. Okay, okay, brilliant. Okay, so yeah. Part of the reason I'm I'm talking about this is that I think a lot of us teachers of young and very young learners, we love using picture books in classes, but like, but sometimes it's difficult if you're trying to plan a course, it can seem like quite a daunting thing, you know, so that um, how, where do you start with it, you know, and how do you create a structure um, how do you fit the language in? Like, what's what sort of the process? So that's what I'm wanted to share with you. My experience. I'm not saying it's the only way or the best way, but um, I want to show you what I do, and and hopefully you'll be able to to get something from that. So we'll look briefly at the why um, and the the benefits of story based courses briefly, and then main part of the session will be about the how, and I'll give you a walk through of my process um, and hopefully that will lead to wow and you'll come away feeling more confident in planning a course around picture books and even if you don't follow exactly my process maybe it'll inspire you with ideas about how you could approach it yourself okay so briefly what are the benefits of story-based courses so um any answers in the chat what can you name some benefits? What do you think are the, the benefits of story-based courses? Engaging, yep. Relat relativity, yes, very relevant. Boosting imagination, I love that. The authentic resources, which is great, yes. Fun, more interesting, a lot of engagement here, yeah. Vocabulary, cultural awareness, really nice to see that. Yes, creating interest. Okay, a lot of around engagement and creativity, the context, brilliant, brilliant, and empathy. Okay, so I think a lot of these, I, I, I agree with them all. <laughs> um, I, I group them into kind of two areas. So the children's experience themselves, which I think a lot in, that you're saying in the chat box there connects with this, I think, but also uh, language acquisition. So I'll just briefly go through some of these benefits. I won't go into too much detail here so we can focus more time on the, the how. Yes, retention. Okay, so this is not both. Okay, so the children's experience, it's a relaxable and enjoyable experience. Okay, so engaging, I think. It encourages critical thinking and creativity. So we've seen a lot of these comments in the chat. That's brilliant. 
um, develops intercultural awareness. Great, I'm glad you mentioned that too. Um, develops social emotional awareness as well. Um, and it provides children with a genuine reason to communicate, which I think is, is nice. You know, so quite often with picture books, um, the children respond to things that they recognize and relate to their own lives. So we had relativity um, in the comments in the chat there. And, and that sparks a more genuine conversation sometimes than what it might be through following a traditional course. Okay, and then from the language acquisition point of view, um, because stories are universal and common, common across cultures, that will aid language acquisition. Um, they provide a memorable context, so you've mentioned this, and so the language is used meaningfully. The illustrations help support the understanding, and as I mentioned before, twice, <laughs> the genuine interaction. Um, so what that means is that when the children are interacting with you and with the picture book in the activities, they're using language, perhaps they're using the, their first language to begin with, but then you're able to provide them with language that they want and they need. Um, so um, it uh, provides a wonderful opportunity for uh, language acquisition in that respect. And this one is key for me because it gives you the exposure to richer language beyond these restrictive vocabulary sets. Um, you know, and uh, there's integrated repetition of language, language chunks throughout the picture books often. And if it's not there, we can add it. I'll come back to that later. Um, but yes, when I think about uh, teaching a course, I'll think about explicit language objectives so language that I'm I'm is my target language that I'm I'm really hoping the children are going to be able to understand or produce and then I'm thinking about implicit language objectives so language that I'm going to give them exposure to um repeated exposure to not necessarily expecting them to be able to produce it at that point but I'm preparing the ground for them to be able to acquire that language easily uh, down the line and some children might be ready to acquire it there and then okay so I think that picture books give us so many opportunities um, for language acquisition okay so that's our that's our why um how what about the how okay um so I'm just going to stop sharing here a second um so Yes, just before we get into the, the steps of the process. Um, and uh, I just, there are some things that I think we just need to bear in mind throughout the whole process. Um, so key is like context, you know, what's your particular context? It's obviously where a lot of us here, a lot of different contexts. And so you've kind of got your own particular context aware um, in the back of your mind. And that might be thinking about things like, um, how many lessons do you have uh, during your course? Um, so how many storybooks or picture books are you going to include? Actually, I'm curious. Um, how many picture books do you think you would include in a course across a school year? And I know some of you said you already have courses. So how many picture books? Can you give me a number? For a year's course, how many do you think you need? Six, three, seven, a dozen, right? Five, two, ten. Okay, actually, these are not wildly different from what what I do myself. Great, perfect. But I mean, it's going to change, isn't it? Because if you only have um, a lesson once a week, maybe you're going to have less picture books. But yeah, so keep in mind your context. Um, and then also we need to bear in mind the, the other developmental needs of the child. So what I'm going to focus on um, more is the language side of things. But we need to be thinking about um, in the back of, backs of our minds, you know, well, maybe not necessarily even the backs, but, you know, the children's, you know, their, their social emotional needs, their psychological needs, their cognitive needs, their... Um, creative needs, you know, their, their physical needs, and all of that will play into 
the type of activities that we're thinking of um, and, you know, when we're selecting books as well, you know, so all of those things are going to be in mind. You might even have in your context um, a particular interest in using drama to raise confidence and that might be something that you've got in mind when you go through the process. Okay, right, so I'm just going to go back to the slides now. And here we go. All right, there we go. So how do we build a course? So my sauce, <laughs> as I said in the video, if you saw that in secret sauce, it's not very secret. So this is an acronym and these are the steps of the process I take. So we're starting with S. Any ideas of what the S could stand for? What's the first step in the process? of building a, a course. Storytelling, story, it could be, yeah, story. That's definitely in within this S, scaffolding, story, student. Okay, I'm just gonna whiz on. And that's actually um, select. <laughs> and part of that is story, okay? But all of these, uh, sound like they would be relevant in this stage. So this is my first step is selecting. I'm starting with topics rather than the story, but that doesn't mean to say that you couldn't start with a story. Perhaps you've got um, a particular group of books that you're particular in, particularly interested in, and that can be your starting point. And then you might look at the topics. <clears throat> I've chosen to start with selecting topics because I think that's something that most of us are quite familiar with. Um, and if you've taught with course books, then that's usually a starting point. So. Um, how do you choose your topics, first of all? Um, well, I look at, these are different areas. So looking at international young learner exams, like what are the topics that are covered at different levels? Um, course book content, so what, what tends to be covered within course books for certain levels? And, and often those are based on the uh, CEFR, so the Common European Framework, you could go directly there as well and, and try and select the topics. So I'm just going to show you, um, I'm going to share this uh, slide. Just one second. Just finding my other slide here. Okay. Thank you for your patience. One moment. Where am I? This is what I want to share. Okay. Right. So First of all, we're looking here, right? So <clears throat> this is, I do this for all different levels in the CEFR. So this is this is an example of pre-A1, but I've also done this for A1, B1, A2, et cetera. Um, so this is Lexis I've found from one uh, uh, exam board, and this is another one. So they had different contexts and then I, I mapped out, you know, the different topics that came up. Um, and these are like can do statements from the CEFR. So um, they are obviously focused on more on the skills and what children are able to do, but they also include uh, the different topics. So that gives me a good idea what topics I want to, to focus on. Just another thing I would do at this, this stage, I'm not focusing on this right now, but I'd write, down as I'm going through that process, any language functions and grammar that tends to come up in those uh, different exams or those different courses. Okay, um, and this this sort of becomes like a master document I go back to and um, and I check through the process. So um, back to the slides. We select our uh, our topics. We know what we're focusing on. Uh, so then, yes, the books. Okay, um, so which books? Well, there's so many, right? There's so many. So always start with what you know and like. Um, so I thought this would be a really great opportunity if we could share in the chat what we know and like. So what are your favorite picture books? Could you share in the chat box? Any favorite books that you have? Dr. Seuss, right. Pete the Cat, yes. Shark in the Park, love it. Oh, I see my favourites too. Very Hungry Caterpillar, Gruffalo, Snake, Snail in the Wheel. Yes, recognise these. Find Waldo, okay. Julia Donaldson, perfect. The Mr. Men, Hand a Surprise. Oh, this is great. 
This is wonderful. Okay, Mr. Men, Cinderella, Ruffalo. Okay, right. These are brilliant. So when I when I started building my story courses, I started with what I knew, and I knew I liked certain authors um, that I was just familiar with. So yes, Julia Donaldson was one. Um, different books by Eric Carroll. Um, what else did I, Nick Sharat, so we had Shark in the Park there, but there's lots of other Nick Sharat books I liked, Rod Campbell, um, and also just fairy tales and song, songs that are based, stories that are based on popular songs. So I knew um, what I liked first. After that, uh, I wonder if we'll be able to see these recommendations later, they're, they're brilliant. Um, okay, so after you know, what you know, um, ask for recommendations, obviously. So we've got loads of them now from each other, which is brilliant. Um, but, you know, as friends, family, and um, there's other Facebook groups and Instagram and all your different channels, you can ask for recommendations. I would be wary though, because um, not all picture books are gonna be uh, appropriate for second language learning or third language learning or fourth language learning when it's not um, first language, but we'll come back to that in a second, it's just uh, different tips to evaluate. Um, and then of course, we've got our internet search. Now I put a laughing face because I thought I would try ChatGPT for this. And I, um, I asked ChatGPT to recommend 10 popular picture books that were based around the topic of colors, because I knew what what books I liked that were based around that topic. And I actually came up with some pretty good ones. I recognized them all and I, was, and I agreed. So actually that's another way if you're looking for a range of books based around a certain topic. Okay, then YouTube. So um, YouTube does have a lot of storytelling videos on it for better or worse, but um, I would look, um, I'd have a whole bunch of like kind of books that I'm, um, interested in but you obviously don't want to go out and buy a whole load of books with, without really seeing them so that's where I think YouTube's really great for that and um, so you can kind of go and find a storytelling video and decide if it's the one for you. Pep Health is another site if you haven't uh, seen that yet um, and they also have picture books by different topics not necessarily the topics that you would find in a language syllabus um, but on kind of bigger themes. So that's an interesting place to look as well. Okay, um, so we've got all these, but how do we know, you know, uh, if it's appropriate for our course? Well, um, you need to make sure it does these things. So it matches the conceptual level of the children. Um, you know, things that are, they can identify from their own life that they don't have, um, the message is just getting lost and going over their head. Um, you, know, you you need to make sure also it's got, well, a pre predictable sequence or a pattern. Partly that's because we know it's satisfying when we have expectations and those expectations are met. Um, and I think that's particularly useful when English isn't their first language. Um, it's got engaging supportive illustrations. Okay, so that's important. Um, and it includes plenty of repetition and rhyme. And even if it doesn't, but you really like it for the other reasons, is there any way for you to include more repetition? For example, um, Julie Donaldson's Monkey Puzzle book, um, I adapt the, the, the way I tell that so that I include more repetition. I, uh, I make sure I include more has got for description and I include phrases like, um, you know, I know, come with me. And that's not in the original, but I know the story will work with that. So can you put repetition where it doesn't necessarily exist if you want to use the book? Um, and similarly with the linguistic level, um, it should be appropriate. If it's not appropriate, can you adapt it if you like it for lots of other reasons? Okay. Um, comics, yeah, I haven't actually used comics. That'd be really interesting, wow. Okay, so we've got our selection. We're on to our A. Any ideas for A? Audience, good one. Adapt, it could be adapt. Appropriate activity. Uh -huh. Aha, I've spotted it. Analyze. First prize to who said that. I missed it, you went so fast. <laughs> and that's, that's my next step in the process. Analyze another one. Okay, so 
on to analyzing. Um, I'm going to go back to that sheet that I, I showed you. And okay. So we've got our story analysis. We'll come to that bit in a, in a second. Let's try this together. Okay, so let's choose a story I think is probably very familiar to most of us here. So the very hungry caterpillar. Okay, so I'd have this uh, story. So any ideas in the chat, topics, topics that we could cover with the very hungry caterpillar? What topics could we talk about? Yes, definitely food. Life cycles, nice. Uh, Colours as well, yeah, days of the week. Okay, brilliant. I better not do it all, I will be here all day, but days of the week. Seasons as well, oh, that's a good one, actually. So actually this might connect, I'm gonna put this in this box, concepts and themes. So it's a good one for spring, so seasons. Numbers as well, yes, yes. Sorry, I can't write it all in at the same time, but yeah, um, concepts. I think life cycle could kind of be in here as well, that spell. Um, I'm, can't keep, healthy and unhealthy food, yes. That's a good concept to explore with it, isn't it? Or so I hear sometimes people prefer to use like sometimes and um, everyday food or sometimes and always food. Um, yeah, insects, changes, yes. Okay, so there's actually a lot of concepts we can explore with this, isn't there? Um, the other one I think I had was um, just feeling hungry, something simple, like <laughs> feeling hungry, you know, for um, maybe your like three-year-olds if you're using this with preschool, that would be important as well. So vocabulary, I'm not going to go and write all this out now, but there would be vocabulary in the story that's connected with, with the topics you've, you've chosen there, the numbers as well, um, potential structures and language points in the story, I would go through and write those in as well, um, <clears throat> as well as you know, they're useful phrases um, and as well as language that's in the story, there might be, like I said, with Monkey Puzzle, there might be other structures or other language points that you're kind of putting in there and you're adapt and your adaptive storytelling. Here's one I did earlier. <laughs> OK, so you can see you don't need to read through all this now. Um, but yeah, there's a lot there, right? Um, a lot of story phrases. There's a lot of vocabulary and I don't have all the things that you said. What I would do is, um, I would, I'm just gonna go back to the other screen actually, uh, one second. I would put everything in this document. That's that's what I do because it's um, basically, I'm creating a master document. So this is something that's gonna be, um, that I'm gonna be able to use for multiple courses and multiple levels. And I'll be using that to kind of select language from for different courses. So I might be using the Hungry Caterpillar with three-year-olds, eight-year-olds, 10-year-olds even. Okay, and then I would be using that um, document. Okay, we're gonna move on. Um, so yeah, that's that, those are the categories I had. I didn't mention story type there, but yes, um, I think that's important. I'll come back to that later as well. Okay. Um, so you, this is a cheat, so I'm just going to tell you, because it's not one word, it's three words, um, and it's unpack the order, okay? Um, so really, it's about order. So then I've been, I'm thinking at this stage about what order do we put the books in? Um, so any ideas for how you decide on how you would decide the order of the stories? Does it matter at all? Quite a, a, a tricky question, but it's something that, yeah, Kathy's saying it doesn't matter. No, if I'm completely honest with you, when I started uh, with this like 10 years ago with infants, I didn't pay too much attention to the order. Um, but when I'm looking at primary, I'm trying to match um, things a little bit more with what's going on in their lives. So I do, and yes, I do kind of think about the order more now. Yes, I think you've come, yeah, simple to more complex, yes. Okay, so this is the, these are the, the kind of things that I'm thinking about. Um, so just to summarize, um, 
a thing about that, the relevance of concepts. So that might be thinking about the stage of the school year. At the beginning of the school year, I quite often, um, I, I want them to be able to kind of review language for feelings, emotions, um, maybe even setting up classroom expectations. So things that tie in with that um, um, and seasonal connections. So you mentioned with Hungry Caterpillar Spring, you know, so I'd maybe want to have that at springtime. Um, and um, language focus. So you mentioned, so things that are familiar, that I think are going to be familiar to them, then moving into newer language and looking for the possibilities for consolidation and building on previous knowledge. I'm just looking at the time here. Oh, we're doing okay still, so, right. Um, and mix of story types. So um, you'll find some of those stories are narratives, um, straightforward narratives. Others are based on songs. Um, others have a kind of a pattern to them or like a chant to them, like walking through the jungle, that's one um, I'm thinking of as well. We're going on a bear hunt, and so it kind of chants and patterns. So what I wouldn't want to have is um, song, 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 narrative, narrative, narrative. So I, I do look at that because I think that um, it's good to make sure that we don't have too much repetition of the same story type um, in sequence. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so these are six, don't worry if you don't know all these books. Um, these are six books that I've used with um, preschool learners, kindergarten, um, and with lower primary. And this is, I'm just going to kind of talk you through what my decisions were about the order. And it's not the only way you could do this. Um, this is just one, one way. So, here. So <clears throat> Meg's Eggs, if you don't know it, it's a, it's a, there's a whole series, Meg and Mog, um, it's a witch and her cat, um, and Meg's Eggs is actually about more about dinosaurs than it is about witches, but anyway, I put this at the beginning because um, there are a lot of feelings, um, very visual as well on the in the illustrations, so that allows me to kind of teach and revise um, um, feelings and emotion vocabulary. Um, very bright illustration, so that's great for reviewing colours at the start of the school year, and it's tying in with Halloween, and I'm quite a big fan of Halloween. <laughs> so, I, but, but saying that, I don't uh, do lots and lots in my classes about Halloween, but this um, creates a connection. So she is a witch, so I can kind of, you know, connect that into Halloween. So it's the conceptual connections there. And then from head to toe, um, so this story is a song. And um, it's focusing on your body, actions, animals. So I think it's quite good to have these kind of tangible, concrete vocabulary that the children can kind of relate to and, um, and, and st start using that um, in an active way quite near the beginning of the course. So, um, and it introduces can. Okay, then piece at last. Um, this is a story that includes family vocabulary. It actually, this is one I kind of um, adapt to make sure that I include more family vocabulary in it, but I know I can connect with that topic. It's based around a house um, and home. So this is gonna help them uh, be able to talk about their own homes. It introduces this, I want, um, if you tell it like this, so like the daddy bear, he wants to go to sleep basically. So you can have that repeating through the book. I want to go to sleep. Um, and then uh, you can revise I can't. So can't can come up in with head to toe because that has, um, you know, can you do it? I can do it. Um, or I can't do it. <laughs> and here he can, you know, I can't go to sleep. So you're kind of creating connections with the language that way. Yes, house. Sophia, he was like, piece at last is a great one for, for the house because um, you've got all the different rooms in it. Yeah. Okay. Um, the three billy goats, gruff. Um, so I'd have that next because that's coming into springtime in, in my context. Um, and so it connects with nature and I can revise and build on this I want with that. Um, so yeah, I want, this isn't very nice, but you know, I want to eat grass, I want to eat you. <laughs> but um, when I've used this, then you can kind of, the kids can take that and then start playing with it as well. I want, um, so I'm, I'm working on that. And then the hungry caterpillar, as you said, that's spring as well and kind of moving 
towards summer life cycles and food. Um, I can focus on I want and, and extend that with the likes and dislikes. And then finally, I'm putting that we're going on a bear hunt. So that's me thinking about summer. And I think this is quite a good one for exploring the world around you. And, um, and then you can kind of connect with the plans that the children might have. Um, what are they going to do? Because it's more of an outdoor time of year. Um, so extend the nature and then and revising the, voca the family vocabulary that we've seen earlier. So that's sort of my justification for choosing that order. But um, depending on what you focus on, you could, you could change that. But that's just the process I go through. Okay. Oh, I didn't even ask you. <laughs> Sorry. So C is collate and create. And this is the fun part, honestly. Um, you know, us teachers like being kind of creative and coming up with ideas, don't we? Uh, and I think collating ideas. I think we're, I think a lot of the time we're quite good at um, like this, you know, we, we come together and, and we share ideas and and we collate and, and take what's useful for us. Okay. Oh, Peace at Last is, is the book. Peace at Last. I'll just even type that. Uh, I, that I like for houses, but uh, okay. Um, so let's go back to our spreadsheet now. Um, here we are. Okay. So there's our hungry caterpillar. We've got all of our stuff there. I use the same sheet and then I go along da, 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 and, oh, actually, that's not what I wanted to do. It's like, well, what are you collating? This is what I'm collating kind of a list of songs, games, crafts, drama, projects, inquiries. You might have other categories as well if you've got different areas of interest. But um, I basically I think about what I know. And I put them in there. I do a search for different things that connect with the topics. And I this is just a kind of a um yeah, collecting all of these different activities and putting them together into one document so I can see them. So I don't really want you to try and read everything that's here. We don't really have uh time for that, but I think um there will be a link in the handout, if I'm correct, um, where you're you'll uh Oh, actually not to this, but there, there, there will be for the Hungry Caterpillar, there's a, a kind of a sample unit that we'll see in a moment. But this is, you know, so I would just put in different songs I know there, so you can probably recognise some of those different games that I think would work, different crafts I know that, that would, would connect with that story, uh, a drama idea there. Okay, so I do that for, for each of the, the story books. And remember, this is kind of like a master document. So this is something that you use for multiple courses, not just for, for one course. So you can keep coming back to this. Um, so, okay, let's go back to here. Okay, so just summarizing that again. So I think about songs, games, crafts, worksheets, drama ideas, project inquiry ideas. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry, I rushed through that one, didn't I? So uh, it's, as I said, for all ages and levels. So that's your master dog. And I, I, I like to use it um, in a spreadsheet type document. You might not be a fan of spreadsheets, not everyone is, but, but using a spreadsheet or Google, um, uh, Google Sheets, I like that because I find it to be one, I can kind of get everything kind of together. And two, it's quite useful, especially when you're thinking about the order stage and creating connections, it's useful to search it. So I think on my computer, it's um, FN or the function button and F, and then you can find and you can search the document. So I might be searching for um, connections with the language point, for example, like has got or um, or searching for connections with spring. And then you can kind of search through those ideas and, and find connections easier. So, yeah. Um, and that's what we looked at there. Oh, thank you. If I build built a house. OK, that's a good one for the house. OK, right. Don't worry about reading all this. <laughs> OK. 
Right, finally, coming towards the end now. So E, what, what could the E stand for, do you think? Our kind of final steps? Engagement, evaluate, execute, evaluate. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, good ideas. Execute, I like that actually. <laughs> Let's do it. Okay, evaluate, examples, engage. Okay, actually, no. No, again, maybe this is me just trying to get my nice word sauce here. I think it connects with evaluate, actually, what I put, though. So I edit it for progression. OK, so, hmm. well, we've done our topics. We've, we've got our books that we, we like. We've analysed them. We've decided on an order. Uh, we've got lots of activity ideas and resources. Um, now we've got to map it to our particular context. Okay, so I've said this is in the back of your head, but now let's just get practical and, and get it into your to your context. So um, I'm wondering, you know, like what would you do at that stage? If what would your next step be? Oh, sorry, Oliver's just joined. And watch the recording. So, are there any ideas what you would do at that point? You've got all of this stuff now. You've got all of these ideas. You've got an order. Mm -hmm. Execute, get right. The mapping. Well, I'll, I'll just, I'm going to just go back and kind of tell you, work backwards from my planner based on time. Yeah, that's, I think this is kind of what I more or less like kind of the way I approach things. I'm just going to share with you what what I do. Um, so I've, there's, there are different things I consider. So how many, as we said at the beginning, how many lessons are you going to have with each story? So yes, thinking about that, that um, the planner as well, like how many lessons are you going to have in the year? When are the holidays? <laughs> um, and yeah, how many books do you want to use and how many lessons you're going to have with each story? So to give you one, um, a couple of examples, um, with one um, course I was doing, there were two lessons a week and I knew that I was going to have six stories I wanted to work with and, and each of those stories were going to have um, eight to ten lessons. Um, so I knew eight to 10 lessons per story. With another course um, that I'm, I was doing, the, I, I could only see the children once a week. And I don't really want to have the same story for eight weeks. I kind of think that, um, and to give them the variety and exposure as well, but three to four lessons, so that was three to four weeks with each story um, for that course. OK, so I think about how many number of how many lessons per story I'd work that out, what made sense for my context. Yeah, who the students are, your objectives. Yeah, so thinking about that and um, the progression from understanding to producing to creating. So we've thought about uh, ordering the story in terms of um, language and what makes sense in terms of um, language progression. But what about um, the skills. So when you, you've got all of these great activities um, and ideas, but how can you order those activities or select activities so that they're first of all going from understanding the language in the story, um, understanding the language you want to work on, and then later getting more independence and, and starting to produce the language and maybe even creating at the end um, within your sort of unit for that story. Um, you know, it might even be that you're thinking, okay, in this, and the first lesson, we're gonna do this whole class game. And then in the next lesson, we'll do the same game, but they're gonna do it in groups. The next lesson, they might do the same game, but they're gonna do it in pairs. You know, it's, you're, you're thinking about how you can get them to kind of be more um, independent and going from receptive skills to productive skills in terms of the activities you're selecting and this as well so that's kind of i've mentioned that really but teacher-led activities where you're managing everything 
to starting to let them have more control, maybe even if you've got the, the, the space for it as well, like child-led activities, um, where you might have your final lesson with your unit with the story and um, with learning stations. So you might just make the, the different games and activities that you've chosen um, available to the children, and then they would have different like time at each station and perhaps they would be playing in in the English that they they know but in a child-led way rather than a teacher way so I would think about that right before we I'm just gonna I know we don't have much time left so I'm gonna so I'll just be a kind of a, a quick um I'll show you what a unit could look like okay um so I'd have a document like this so you could put your title there obviously how many lessons and then this part, so your explicit language objectives and your implicit language objectives, this is where we go back to our um, all this work that we did earlier. So if I was working with my creating a course for my five year olds, for example, OK, there's all this food vocabulary, but maybe I'm really just concerned about them. I want them to be able to understand and produce that language. So then um, I would focus on that, but I'd have my implicit objectives. So I would still give them exposure to all of this, um, but um, what I'm really wanting them to produce in the activities and practice in the activities is this, okay? Um, and I would do that for, for all of the those different points. So what structures am I gonna focus on? Uh, what phrases am I gonna focus on? And I would kind of map that for, that particular class, those particular learners. Okay. Um, and um, then, and on, sorry, you can see there as well, revise. So yeah, I might be putting a note. So I know at the beginning of the year, as I said, I wanted to, I expected the learners to know um, some emotions language, but maybe not using the, the verb to be with I'm, um, um, and maybe not knowing some of the other ones like surprised or uh, scared. OK, so I would be revising some vocabulary there. So I would I'd, I'd have that there to have a note and to kind of help me with the phrase. Then um, I would be using this part to kind of map activities over to the lessons. So for that, say that was Hungry Caterpillar, eight lessons. Um, I would be choosing perhaps um, two or three key games that I'm going to, probably going to repeat across those lessons um, and maybe two songs. And then I'd be selecting which activities um, would work in that order. So just to give you an example, you know, there's a lot of songs there, a lot of games there, but I would just be selecting what I uh, thought was appropriate for that particular group. And then like with the crafts, so I know, for example, that um, at the end, I want them to do this drama, but that's, gonna, that's not gonna be lesson one. You know, they're not gonna have to be able to produce the language by then. So this, this is going to be my kind of like, act out the, the story idea. I could actually put links back to that document if you had more detail as well. Um, and at the beginning, I know I'm going to be doing a, a more of a receptive uh, activity with food, and it might be like a, a colouring dictation, or it might be a, a, a cut and paste, find something, treasure hunt to create something. That might be my main activity. So that, because they, they were understanding, so I would be looking at this and then uh, mapping it across to this. Okay, and just to show you, there's the one I did earlier. Okay, so you don't have to. Um, this I do still have a lot there. Explicit language objectives, <laughs> kind of um, got quite high expectations. But then there's a lot that's in implicit. Don't read it all, <laughs> um, and then I've just mapped out these in a sensible order. Okay, right. So I'm going to go back to our thing. Uh, here we are, and. That's kind of us. Okay, so we've got our sauce. So do you remember what they were? <laughs> S was, what was S? Select, yes, Anna, price to Anna, Natasha, good. A, oh, whoops, oops, I've already said it. A is 
it's the fastest typer kind of competition, isn't it? You? Oh, I've done it again. What was you? Unpack, good, unpack the order, yes. Okay, C. Collate, yes. Collate and create, good. And E was? Edit, yeah, edit for progression, okay. So thank you so much for listening. Um, and yeah, you can find me on Kids Club English. I'm on the social media. I'm on LinkedIn as Fiona Hunter, but Kids Club English everywhere else. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fiona. That was fantastic. I think that that was so inspiring and so interesting to see exactly how we can integrate uh, stories it, like fully into the curriculum right because often we think oh these are lovely things but I just don't have time but yeah. when you start to analyze it ev every part of it is so useful and so relevant often to what students there's, have to learn there's so much potential and I think like the yeah like the, the amount of exposure they get to language that they are a lot of them are ready to you know um, acquire it's, it's, it's amazing you know yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, humans love stories, don't they? So it's, yeah. it's the perfect way to learn. Okay, so we've got lots of questions coming in. Um, let's, let's see how many we can do. So, okay, I saw a nice one to start with. What's, um, this is from Elena. She says, what's Fiona's favourite storybook and why? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it's difficult actually it's so difficult yeah it's so difficult I think I you know I think a lot of the ones that um you've mentioned here have been my favorites like oh I mean I've used monkey puzzle a lot so I'm very comfortable with that but um I do I like some of the traditional fairy tales as well I love working with um the three billy goats gruff and um I like The Smartest Giant in Town by Julia Donaldson. Okay. And um, yeah, and I, I like that one. We're going on a bear hunt. That's a big favorite. That's my brain just now. But I, I keep learning about new new stories. Um, yeah. So, I've, you know, and I've, I've got other stories. I'm like, oh, I'm determined to kind of integrate them. Um, yeah. And yeah. what is it that makes a really like, you know, the best ones that work really well? Is it the message of the story? Is it the vocabulary? Uh, or is it something else? Well, it's not the vocabulary for the kids. That's not what I mean. <laughs> they, yeah. I mean, they learn it, but that's not their kind of main focus. Yeah, the ones that I think it's sometimes, because sometimes people are, are worried about, you know, like, oh, I can't use a story across different lessons. Um, but it's the stories that kids, um, you know, like, once they get that kind of they, they see it again and again and they get the confidence where they're joining in and they're participating and they're they're really into that that I mean I recently I used um over in the meadow which is actually a song book and you know um yeah you're doing the same you know the same story but they're seeing the same story each day but like it's the books that work are the ones that, well the kids kind of yeah, they can start to participate in. So you as the teacher are kind of showing them and gradually, so maybe the first telling, you're doing most of the telling, but then giving them the opportunities to participate and interact. And then when they see that, that's when the spark happens and then they can start to take over, you know, control and tell it themselves. Yeah, brilliant. yeah, that's lovely. Okay, so there's quite a few people asking about age. So obviously <laughs> you were talking about uh, like primary, younger uh, students or those were the ones you had in mind. Um, have you got any thoughts about how you might use storytelling with secondary school learners or even adults? Well, I can't really speak to experience of that, unfortunately, but I do know um, uh, Sandy Mauro, she did a fantastic um, session with secondary. Um, well, it wasn't just secondary, it's just they are suitable for all ages. Look at that Pepelt um, site, I think, um, to, uh, because they're such great springboards into really, sometimes really quite difficult topics. Yeah. That I think would be great for secondary, things like, um, you know, war even, which is like, you know, but you can you can you can broach these topics through yeah. picture books and um and I think that would work really well 
Uh, and the interpretation of pictures, but I, I haven't actually had experience of that. One. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, I'm I'm a big fan of of using stories with at all ages, with mm. secondary and adults as well. And if you feel that a, a, they're too old for pictures, a picture book. That, but lots of stories, lots of books also have a film, so you can watch a scene from the film and read the, the yes. book, which is, um, works Absolutely. really well. Absolutely, the, the tasks are really different. Because even yeah. if you were going back to, I mean, I think we all like, um, you know, you've got a fondness for stories from your own childhood. So I think even bringing that in, but your tasks are a little bit different. So you know, remember, you know, remember this, and then and then encouraging um, the the learners were them to take their own twist on things. I'm like, okay, you know, so it wasn't a, a caterpillar. I don't know, it was a, a, a five foot centipede or it was a, you know, an alien yeah. from outer space. You know, what does, <laughs> but, but, you, but, you, but get them to kind of get creative with it and, and reinvent yeah. the story. But, but then they've got the structure from something that's familiar and then they can kind of, um, to yeah. put twist on things. I love that. So get them to retell, but just change like one element, like the main character, or make a happy yeah. ending instead of a sad ending. Or... Yeah. Okay, I love it. So um, you mentioned like the choice of story, whether it's uh, stories from people's own childhood or, and actually we've got a comment from um, Anindya a, a in the comments, in, well, a question, which says, thank you for bringing up the concept of decolonizing. How important is it uh, for us to simplify retelling through translation of our native traditional tales, um, just as children read collections like Aesop's fables? So mm. is, is that something you could consider that translating, telling, retelling traditional stories that you know they're familiar with? Oh, definitely. And it's, you know, it's something I want to have and bring in more to my own courses. I don't, I, I suppose I've not thought about it in terms of translating because I don't have the skills, right? But right. um, but I think that's part of the wonder of picture books. It could be in any language, but it's, you know, is is you as a storyteller telling the story as you know it through English. And it, it yeah. do you know something that happened? I, I was recommended a story, uh, like kind of for around winter time. Um, uh, little Robin Red Vest and in my kind of enthusiasm um, I went and ordered it you know, straight away I was like I looked on YouTube and I was like you know, okay yeah this will, this will be perfect tie in with winter and um, kindness and um, and yeah so I ordered it and then it arrived at home and it was in German I was like oh <laughs> but it doesn't matter it doesn't matter. And I think that's right. Like, you know, we, we there are so many stories like from around the world. And I think maybe hopefully maybe David will be um, coming back yes. to that. Like, I can't wait for that session. But um, yeah, like bring bringing them in. And if it's yes. a picture book and you're using it, then it, you can tell it any way you want it in any language you want as yeah. well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. So that could be um, part of the selection, thinking what stories will be interesting and relevant to your, mm -hmm. your learners, right? You don't exactly. just have to do um, what's considered a, you know, a really no. good story in Britain might not work no, in your context. No, no. But then again, yeah. um, using the story to kind of open up the dialogue. So there's some things with, um, yeah. So, you know, okay, well here, um, what are they doing? Why are they playing this game? Like, you know, do you know this game? If you don't know this game, then, you know, what, what do we do here instead? Or what do we normally eat? You know, and, and that's that's where the genuine kind of um, communication happens and that kind of um, developing cultural awareness and, and looking for sim similarities and differences, yeah. you know. Yeah, that's lovely. And that's another activity that works with primary and you can do yeah. the same at secondary or with adult learners as well, right? Finding, yeah. oh, does this remind you of anything or what's yeah. different? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, right, I'm just looking at, we've got some questions coming in from, from Facebook as well. So um, this is a question from Emad um, talking about if we if we want to emphasize the outcome, the learning objectives, and, and really um, make the case for using stories, what is the main benefit of using stories? Well, the main benefit in terms of language acquisition? 
Um, here, you ready to think, do you think it's good to integrate all the skills? Uh-huh. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there are so many no, benefits, it's really yes, hard to, to say what the main one is, right? It is. Um, and I think, yeah, and I mean, it does depend on how you approach um, it in, in the classroom and what, what activities you use. But yes, you've got listening. I, I do focus a lot on, on speaking um, with the activities I use, but of course there's writing. There's, you, you can bring in all the skills. Um, yes. For me, well, why... I think another this is maybe maybe this isn't the main one, but it's but it's definitely an important one for me, is that I love that um there if you're using picture books in the classroom, um and then that's something that the children can take outside of the classroom easier into into their worlds, you know. Mm -hmm. Um and if there are YouTube videos of like them telling that story, they can see that the parents can see it. They can it, it's it's kind of a, a message that English goes beyond, you know, a subject. Um they're, they're more alive to me, I think. Yeah, I love it. Okay, thank you. Um right on that note, that is a, a wonderful <laughs> note to finish on that it takes it takes it be, beyond just the mechanics of language, yeah, right? It's yeah, about yeah. stories make us human. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Fiona. I'm afraid thank that's you. all we have time yeah. for. Um, I just want to mention to everybody, though, that we are going to be having a, a live question and answer session with Fiona. So you, you haven't missed your chance. She's going to be back with us on, uh, on our Teaching English Facebook page. Uh, on uh, Which one is yours? Is, is it the 17th, Fiona? It's the 17th, yeah. It's the 17th, okay. So we really want to continue the conversation. And one of the things we love about our um, teaching English community and having all of you here are the ideas that you share and the conversations we have with you. So please join us um, on our Facebook page and you can ask Fiona anything you want to ask about using stories um, and integrating them into the syllabus. So wonderful. Thank you to everybody. We'll see you again in 15 minutes. We'll be starting our next session, which is the, the panel. So looking forward to seeing you all there.